I hope that you uh, enjoy this, and I, I beg you, Venerable, if you will please teach us the Dharma. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. If we could just bow in and sit for one minute. I desire kindness. 
So it takes us sometimes to drop back down into the heart. We've been so high and heady and intellectual with it. I mean, after all, that's what mindfulness is all about, right? <laughs> but I think the Buddha was talking about something else. And that's what I thought we could have a little conversation about tonight. He said that everything he did, he did out of compassion for the welfare of many. And so some of us speak about the Dharma using eloquent words, but it's not actually reflected in our habit energy. We get nervous when we even start moving towards anything that might open up our heart, get a, get a little shaky. You know, can't, can't be seen, can't let them see you sweat because sometimes what the heart says, do the head's not for that. You know, it's saying, no, 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 no. We need, no, 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 no. We need to go in this direction. And the heart is saying something else. So this habit energy, the things that we do every day, the things that we say every day, the things that we Think every day. If we uh, are not allowing the actual heart to be reflected in that, then uh, the Dharma is empty of its power. Uh, because its power is only manifested through us, through what we see and uh, think and what we say and what we do and how we touch things in the present moment. 
And so we talk about the great revelations that we have, and we boast about our teachers, and, and you know, some say, I follow Shakyamuni Buddha, and some are like, I follow Baha'u'llah, and they say, I follow Jesus, and some are saying, I, I follow uh, the Torah, and, and so we have all of this, and all of them are fine, but we are lovers of them only when we live them. Mm -hmm. And when we don't, which often, even though we have a desire to, you know, we are, are quick to rejoice in the fact that we can see our shortcomings. We can see our errors. So it's not a thing to be so sad about because at least we can see. We're not blind. I mean, like, if the Dharma can find me, I'm not lost. And, so, <laughs> and, so, and it finds me all the time. You know, because I think I'm over here, and they say, ah, you are here. Um, and so when we live these things, then only are we uh, are a lover. And when we fall short, we repent quickly and get back on the path. And I know, like, somebody's hair is standing up now because I use the R word, you know. Um, but it just shows that how sometimes we're even adverse to... Um, Asking someone's forgiveness to acknowledging when we have done wrong because our hearts have become so stony and we become stiff-necked and resistant. But Thich Nhat Khan said something. He said the present moment is the only time over which we have dominion. And he said, the most important person then is always the person you are with right now. The one who is right in front of you. For who knows if you will have dealings with any other person in the future, not even in the next moment. He said, that is the miracle of mindfulness. That's the kind of mindfulness that we are talking about. Now, how to be happier without things. Not, you know, how to, uh, like, uh, we've got mindful golfing. We've got <laughs> mindful, you know, just mindful, everything that you can think of. But he said, the present moment is the only time over which we have dominion. So I ask you in this present moment, who is the most important person in your life? And automatically, our, our hearts and our minds go to, to someone that we love. But Thai inspires us to think differently even than that. That's why when I'm with you, I'm fully with you, 100%. I, got, I, have, a, I have children over there somewhere, but my mind is not on them right now. When I'm here... I'm fully here with you. You get my whole heart. You get my whole mind. You provide the fire. And I will be the sacrifice. If we could only think this way, we would be respectful of the person standing in, in front of us, regardless of who they are, regardless of what they're saying, regardless of what they're doing, if we can only be kind to, if we can only respond with compassion to the one who's just confessed his most heart-wrenching shame to us and, and stands stripped and naked before us, if we can only humble ourselves in the moment and suspend the judgment in regard to the other person, when we have a difference assessing what's happening right now or what just happened, if we can only realize that it, it's a fool who takes no pleasure in understanding others. One day the Buddha was uh, in uh, one of uh, his uh, compounds and, uh, you know, he like traveled from place to place so they didn't consider him like a resident. He was a visitor. And they were having uh, some words with each other. And he said, friends, friends, you should not act like this. And they said, look, we got this. 
And so uh, he left it, and they continued uh, to argue with one another. And he came back again and said, friends, friends, you shouldn't act like this. And again, they told him this was their, this was their uh, community, and, and let, let them worry about this. And he went a third time and said, friends, please don't act like this. <laughs> they gave him the look, and he went on back to his hut. And then later he gathered up his robe and his bowl, and he left that community. And as he walked down that dusty road, he began to say to himself, when all are shouting at once, none thinks himself a fool. He said, he abused me, he beat me, he robbed me. Those who harbor such thoughts in them, hatred shall never be appeased. He abused me. Yes, he did. He beat me and he robbed me. But those who do not harbor the thought in them, hatred is definitely appeased. Hatred is not overcome by hatred, but hatred is overcome by non Hatred. So whatever is rising up in that moment, in the mind, dropping down into the heart, making the heart bitter and cut off and separated, he said that is the greater tragedy. That must be uprooted. Okay. So the fool takes no pleasure in understanding others. Rather, he delights in his or her own opinions and own views, if only we were willing to be able to be a true friend. If we could accept that in this present moment, this person in front of me is the most important person in my life. So in his first letter to Christian disciples living in Corinth, I give everybody some, Paul wrote, he said, I appeal to you, brethren, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same discernment. When I was with you, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the world, as infants in spiritual understanding. He said, I fed you with milk, not solid food, because you were not ready for it. And even now you're not yet ready, for you're still worldly, for you, still, you are still self-centered, behaving only in a human way. So he tells us something about what it takes to walk in the spiritual life. And when we're seeking that way of life, we are agreeing to something. Not just me, but not you, not just you, but not me, but we are collectively agreeing to something. The uh, abandoning, the uprooting of the self-cherishing that only makes me think of things in relationship to myself. The me and the my, the I-making. Every great one has said, I give myself away so you can use me. And it takes something to be lifted up into that place where one can give himself away. But it is the great prize of our spiritual accomplishment. Indeed, it is not worthy, but it is high, and it is holy. I know sometimes these words get confusing because there's a, a spiritual language and there's a worldly language, and we like to mix them up. But maybe we shouldn't do that so that we don't uh, recalibrate and bring down those high things into low places. Because we find that they won't give us what we're looking for. And then we begin to abandon them when there was nothing wrong in them. It's just not understanding the languaging and not being able to enter into the high call. So when we're seeking the spiritual way of life, we agree to abandon something. What have you abandoned? 
We can only abandon it when we can realize that, that what we have been reaching for and what we have been bringing to our bosom has not brought the fulfillment that we are looking for. People ask me all the time, how, how, how could you like give up this and give up that and give up the other to be among us? I didn't give up anything. When that life started feeling dusty to me, you know, when the glitter started falling away, then I looked for something else. But as long as that was there, I like stayed with that. I, I, uh, they talk about uh, Osho, and uh, maybe, maybe I, too, I do too a little bit, but Osho was saying, like, just let him have go at it. You know, like he was hedonistic. He said, like, when they, when, they'll get tired of that after a while, and then they'll come this way. Well, sometimes a lot of damage was done by the time they got tired. But, <laughs> but it's, a, it's a true point that you will come to the end of all, all of these things. The one who's rich knows that money can't buy them happiness and it can't buy them love. Now, I've been poor and I've been rich. I can tell you, rich is okay. But, <laughs> but, but there are things that it cannot buy you, is what I'm saying. So when we become attached to our money, we're bound to suffer. And some of us want to be the most popular, and so we cleave to our, our friends, but we we know when we're sitting alone that, they, that there is some ulterior motive. There's something that they want from us, something that we're trying to get from them, and we can't get it, so we need more friends, and we need more friends that, to fill that emptiness that we have inside, that sense of self that says, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, that sense of self, oh, looking for love, but in all the wrong places. Because he says, you know, if you're looking out there for love, you may not get it, you know. So better to invest that time, you know, in loving yourself. When I walk in the door, I'm not looking to be loved. I'm looking to love somebody. No. And when we haven't uprooted our secret fears and our faults, then we stay in terror of being found out, of being discovered, you know. I'm a fraud. Um, there is the guilt. There is the shame. Better to come clean and start over. Some might not accept you. You know, that's all right. That's on them. You know, what they think and what they do, that's their karma. We're all owners of our own. But if I've stepped into a wrong spot, a wrong place, I can just step out of it and get back on the path. Now, I have to admit, uh, the Buddha stories are not that encouraging. There was Anguli Mala, <laughs> you know, Anguli Mala, Mala had uh, already killed 999 people, and he had vowed to kill 1,000 so he could get this, this secret uh, teaching from a bad teacher. And um, you got to be careful. Uh, and, uh, and while he was in the forest, there was the Buddha there, and this was his 1,000th kill, right? And so he starts trying to catch up to the Buddha, and faster he, he goes, I mean, it seems like the further away he's getting from the Buddha. And, the, and he said, why don't you stop? And the Buddha said, why don't you stop? <laughs> and he didn't know what he meant, but it stopped Angulimala in his tracks. And, and, uh, and the Buddha talked with Angulimala, and he turned, he changed in that moment. You know, he didn't have the whole Pali Canon, and he didn't have the Prajna Paramita, and he didn't have the Diamond Sutra, and he didn't, have, he didn't have all of that. He said, why don't you stop? And that was enough to prick, to quicken something in him and say there must be another way. Now, in the end, they killed him, though, I have to tell you. <laughs> That's the end of the story. But he died a happy man. <laughs> you know, the thing is, we're all going to die at some point. Do I want to die, die grasping and full of fear, or do I want to die a happy man? You know, that's the, that's the question. <laughs> they stoned him. They said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's a, that monk right there, isn't that Angulimala? <laughs> You know, that's really not funny, because it was, uh, 
because we like to have good, good stories at the end, you know. <laughs> but unfortunately, there's this little thing called um, cause and condition, causality, you know. And we have to be aware of it, you know. We can't plant uh, lemon seeds and expect an apple tree. And so we have to be circumspect about how we carry ourselves and what we're cultivating in our heart and in our mind every day. And so we talk about this cheetah all the time, and it's been translated the mind. But the Buddha was talking about the mind of the heart because that's the space from which we live and move and have our being in the world. That's the thing that touches them. Even when you can think of the worst person in the world who has no conscience for anybody, and then they love somebody, you were like, what's wrong with her? You know, that that person could, could even fall in love with them, but everybody has some redeeming quality. Everybody is loving. And then, and then when that happens, the person's like, Eureka! You know? And uh, or they have a child, and this baby completely transforms, and they, like, pledge all their wealth to somebody, you know, to, to serve in hum, humankind or something like that. But that one profound encounter with the heart, that's what I'm talking about. And if your dharma is not about this, then you need to keep digging. And if your discipline is not moving towards that, then we need to keep worrying. Um, we can allow each person to think what they will. Because it takes courage to make this kind of a turn. It takes courage to be able to open up one's heart. It's easy to love people that love you. <laughs> it's not so easy to love people that don't love you. It's not so easy to love people that are trying to harm you physically, mentally, or emotionally. Now, I'm not saying you have to stay with them, you know, or that they have to stay. I mean, you can tell me, see that door right there? There's no lock on it. So uh, you don't have to go away mad, but you do have to go away. <laughs> so we can apply some wisdom, you know, and knowing how to flow in this. But it takes getting out of this uh, self uh, centeredness to be able to impartially see what actions we need to take and how to do them with a kind of equanimity and open heartedness. In the Hebrew book of Proverbs, uh, we are encouraged that one who is a friend loves at all times, not some of the time, not when it's convenient. Not when it's something in it for him, for them, but but a friend loves at all times. Just to make a determination to be a friend is so much. It's so high. It calls us to something. Just to be a friend, we have to apply wisdom to that love and to that friendship. I heard someone talking yesterday. And, you know, he has a friend, and the friend was just expecting him to find anything of his, and he says, I don't want to do that. I said, fine, you don't have to do it. You don't have to get angry, you did not do it. You don't have to get upset, you have to mad. You can just say to them, I love you, but that I can't do. And you can tell him why, you know, if it doesn't align with, with my values. You know, I care for your welfare, and to me, that takes you into a dangerous path. It's not good for you. I mean, like I have this thing about chocolate. And uh, so everybody knows it. Everywhere I go all over the country, you know, they're like, they're bringing uh, candy bars. So I go back home with a shopping bag full of candy bars. But the thing is, I have diabetes. And so, um, and, and so like I look at the candy and I'm thinking diabetes. I look at the candy. And then I, I just get out the candy and a needle. And, and that's the way I handle it. You know, so so finally, I just had to ask her, please don't don't bring don't give me any more candy because you're killing me here. You know, like I love it, 
you know, and, uh, and I don't have the discipline. I'm like, like I've given up everything, given up lying, cheating. Good. Now, all I got left, you know, get, I, all I have left is candy bar. Can't I just have a candy bar? You know, and so, so as we start going through our life and we start refining our life, and we start, you know, stripping away things. We get to that place and we'll get to something and the buck stops here. We think like, I've given up everything. Can I just have this? And then we're called to give up that. So let me think before I tell her. Yeah, yeah. So I have not had a candy bar since I've been here. I have some, um, some in my bag. But I mean, I mean, because they put it in my bag. I'm not going to eat it. Is what I'm saying. You know, I have it, and it's only because um, my work's not finished. My work's not finished, and I want to be able to finish it. I want to be able. I I was invited to um, teach in Bhutan last year with uh, Judith and. I couldn't go because my health wasn't good enough. The doctor said, you go, they go send you back in a body bag. He said, you not, you can't take it. And so I worked this year getting my body. I know it doesn't look like it's in that good of shape, but it's so much better than it was because I decided, for me, it doesn't matter. You know, but when I thought about my work tonight, I could do it for you, even when I couldn't do it for me. And so the Buddha said, a good friend does what is hard to do and gives what is hard to give. I was uh, talking with uh, Norm yesterday, and he said something that was so profound that someone left their fortune in his care. And he said, um, he was a Buddhist, but I'm not. Nevertheless, I have observed him over a decade handling that money like it was his own, you know. He said, I have a responsibility to him. I gave my word. I would do that. Sometimes we give our word, but as the time starts ticking on, you know, like we start getting weary in well-doing. You know, but he stayed the course even when it wasn't like actually his thing. And in that process, so many of us have been blessed. But that's a good friend who does what's hard to do and who gives what's hard to give. And so there are three patterns or, or, or ways of uh, cultivation that's necessary on the spiritual path to produce a heartful sangha, a heartful spiritual community. Uh, and you can, your sangha can be anywhere you are along with someone else. It doesn't have to be a Dharma center, you know. It can be this campus even. Yeah. It can be any place that you go and gather with others around whatever you're gathering uh, around. And he said, beyond merely studying the Dharma, we have to cultivate some things. And I like to share these three things with you. The first one, we could consider relational, uh, a kind of relational pattern. Uh, it requires us to connect with one another. You know? And we always want someone to connect with us. I'm not going to go out my way, but can't you see that I'm sitting here? You know, so, so there's a looking for someone to do something, someone to make that first step, someone, you know, uh, I'm not going to do it, you know, but that speaking to each other, being interested, I mean, really interested in the welfare of another, just one person. If you could just start being interested, concerned about the welfare 
of one person. You know, here's the thing that a lot of times I'm not having a good day. But the thing about joy, rejoicing in the successes of others is that if I'm failing this day, but I'm rejoicing in your success, then I still have a good day. If I only had my day to think about, it'd be pretty crappy. But I can rejoice. So every day I'm turning my mind to rejoicing in somebody else's success. And that raises me up over the course of that day. And I find myself not so steeped in my own woes and my own trouble. Misery being my only friend. And you know misery likes company. And so we learn a way of looking for something else. Looking uh, to see the, the goodness, you know, the rain falling on uh, the just and the unjust. You know, like we talk about getting, uh, well, they got what they deserve. You know, but when it's an algo round, like, we don't want to always get what we deserve. Like, well, every, every single one of us <laughs> deserves a little mercy now. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. We're looking for a little mercy when it's, when the, when it's our turn, you know. And so... This kind of connecting, being willing to put someone's needs above your own. Just someone's happiness in the moment. You know, you see somebody happy, yeah, but well, wait till I tell them this. And then you tell them something like, just bust their bubble for the day. You know, uh, you know just having goodwill towards another. Uh, you know, like hearing all the rooms. What I like about the monastic life is that we have some instructions. Well, at least the monks do. They switch them up for the nuns. But for the monks, it says, like, if you didn't see something yourself, then don't talk about it. Don't tell anybody else about it. If you didn't hear it for yourself, don't. Of course, now when it got to the women, it said, you know, if you see it, if you hear it, if, if it was a rumor, if you suspect it, you need to tell somebody, you know. So that I already knew then that couldn't be the, uh, the Buddhist teaching because he just gave a teaching on what is the right way to hold something. It doesn't mean that we ignore it or that we overlook it. But he talks about there's a procedure and there's a process for bringing forth grievances. And he went on to identify that. Uh, so, so we're not confused. We're like, I don't know what to do. We know what to do. He told us step by step what to do. These, just consider they're not a monk anymore. They, they just have on similar clothing. But if these, then they need to do this. These, you need to do this. These, and he laid it all out for us. And so we, so we kind of understand what we're, what we're doing. So that saying, I see you, I know you're here. Actually saying hello to someone. Encouraging another when you see that they're troubled or that they're down. I've, I've made many mistakes, and I'll make many mistakes in my life. When some comes, someone comes to me and says, friend, you're going in the wrong direction. You know. And even if I get upset with them because I'm trying to cover it, or even when you know, I think that it's not as bad as they think it is, you know, then I still appreciate. Because it gives me something to reflect on, to think about. Because I know that I am the owner of my own karma. So I'm not talking about being a busybody. You know, there's a difference. Uh, that's like being at the water fountain at 8 every morning when they gather. Because the one who's not at the water fountain, that's the one who gets talked about. You know, so making sure that you're there, you know how it works. And, and I know that that I was a gossiper. That was a thing because I'm a storyteller. I'm a griot. So, like, I could, like, really, like, tell a story. But <laughs> I was uh, really working on this about 25 years ago, uh, or maybe 30, because I was still uh, something like that. I was still sort of one foot in, uh, in the world and one foot out. Still had to be around people. And I was... Um, and it pricked me one time because somebody was saying something, you know. And as I listened, at first I was like just weighing in in a neutral way. Uh, but then I remembered something that person had done to me. And it's like slid off a neutral, 
you know, and what I was saying, it was, it was the truth. But I gave something to it, you know. So a little bit of meanness uh, filtered in there. So it's not always the words, but it's the energy that they ride upon, you know. So somebody asked me, well, should I do this with that person? And I, I started off with, you know, they're a pretty good person. I mean, you have to make your own decision. Mm. But, but I tell you this. And, and then I like, slid off a little bit with that. And then I had to stop right in the middle and said, I'm sorry, I'm gossiping. And I turned and I went back to my desk. So now I'm, everybody's on the house with me like, watch what you say to her. You know, uh, because I no longer fit their pattern. But it was so refreshing for me because I found myself. That's why I always say, again, if the Dharma can find you, you're not lost. You know, just get back on the path. You know, so not being a busybody, but, but just connecting to say to someone, you know, let's keep them in our thoughts. Or I have you in my thoughts. Or to just let them know that you are available. You know, don't be trying to force them to talk to you and tell, and tell their business. You know, just letting them know you are available. And then really having, you know, them in your thoughts in that way. A lot we can do with the good heart that just considers others and ponders their predicament, and that person doesn't even have to know that we know their predicament. Cultivating this kind of heart. The second, that was connecting with one another. The second is the missional pattern, like cultivating a heart for others. And the Buddha said this is the pattern that is the most neglected. I mean, you know, they called his disciples the analyzers. They also called them the happy ones. And as, it's very rare that you can meet somebody who's like a critical thinker and, and very analytical and they're happy too. I mean, that in itself is a miracle. <laughs> and so, so what was he talking about with this? And what is it that they were analyzing that brought them so much joy. He said that, that you know, this pattern uh, of cultivating a heart, he said that it was the, it's the most neglected. He said it was the quickest path. So Buddha was not against devotion, per se. And he certainly wasn't against service. But, I mean, you know that because he devoted his whole life to it. And he told his disciples, he said, you go out, don't any two go in the same direction. And he said, and one who doesn't serve the people is not worthy of his meal or his robes. That is the way that he trained. So he served everyone with such as he had. Such as he had, he freely gave. So we have different gifts, we have different abilities, we have uh, different skills, uh, we have different resources, and we give such as we have. We serve with our, our vidges, our, um, and uh, the vidges, like uh, somebody asked me, what are our vidges? And I didn't know. I asked my master. And it says, what do you know the holy beings do? And a vigis of what they don't do. So whatever is in your mind, that, that uh, image for you of what one who is righteous would do, that is what one should do. You know, no, that's different things for different people. Because, I, I mean, I was married, and my husband, <coughs> he would say to me, I was Diane then, and uh, he said, Diane, 
He said, I don't think it takes all that. You know, he said, you believe that you're God's child, and I believe I'm God's child. And you're doing all of this, all of this groveling, all of this uh, tithing, all of this serving, doing that. I'm his child. He made me. This is what he got. And so, and he was like happy with that, you know, but I was always struggling. I was always flagellating myself, always feeling that I'm not good enough. He said, no, I think my daddy loves me just as I am. And uh, and I looked at the, at the difference in the two worlds. But you see, but that's, that's the mind speak. That's whatever the mind thinks and ponders on. The way the mind leads or inclines. You know, whose mind? Your own mind. Your own mind. So our, our own mind condemns us uh, or, or lifts us. So we need to know what's... Uh, in the mind and, and, and how we can use the ways that we look and understand things to serve, to serve others because that's what the longing is, this, this need for connection that we think that we have. But it's, it's the reaching for the, the other, for a certain type of wholeness, not the one that they told us like all women need a man so they can be whole. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about how uh, we find our greatest sense of satisfaction in serving others. And he called this the quick path, but he said uh, to almost unbinding. You know, like almost don't count in most games, you know, uh, except maybe horseshoes or something, you know, but almost unbinding. The problem with unbinding is that you have to untie your own knots. You have to realize it for yourself. You can't just walk in somebody else's empowerment that can encourage you, but you can't ultimately rely on anyone else's goodness, anyone else's grace, anyone else's power, anyone else's realizations. I was with a master, and she was bombastic. How I found her, I went to a a vegetarian restaurant. I was taking some of my uh, Tai Chi students there, and... um, uh, and, we, and this was a new place, and when we walked in the door, it was more cafeteria style, and I was looking for some, you know, something a little bit more upscale because it, it was a treat. And as I turned to leave, uh, she had some books, or there were some books about her on a, on a bookcase or like on a, on a shelf like that, and Master stepped right out of that book right in front of me. You know, so when I read that story in the, in the Bible, about the uh, man that was riding on an ass and that and the ass stopped and he took out his whip and he started beating him and the ass turned to him and said, what you hitting me for? Can't you see that angel right there standing with that sword? But the man didn't see it. So, so sometimes you have some experience and people are like, oh, I don't believe that. I really don't care because it's really true. It's true for me. It's something that I experienced, that direct experience. That's why the Buddha is always talking about have a direct experience and you know something for yourself and you don't have to wonder. You don't have to have faith with something. You don't have to... You can know something for yourself, but it's according to what we want to know and what we're willing to put our energy and effort behind to know. And so she stepped out there right in front, like a hologram something or other, and I had a complete meltdown because I never experienced anything like that before, right, in the, right there in the, in the middle of the store. And nobody could figure out what was wrong with me because nobody saw anything but me. And then one of her waitresses came running over, and she whispered, said, did you just see Master? I said, yes, I did. She said, you want to know what that's all about? I said, yes, I do. And so, uh, and, and then that story went on, and, and it led where, where it led, uh, and that becomes one more of my stories. You know, uh, but it's like that. But when I was with her, this is the point that I'm trying to make. I'm telling you, life, the living was easy. You know, I never had need for anything. I was always in a happy mood. I had this sweet mind, you know. Uh, but one day it dawned on me, this is not my mind. This is not my heart. This is master's. It was like uh, I was in the, uh, wrapped up in her perfume. 
So people thought I was smelling sweet, haha, but I knew myself. I was no sweeter than when I came, you know? <laughs> and so I went to her one day and I said, Master, I'm going to take my leave because uh, I want to get what you have. And I can't get it being here wrapped up in you. I'd love to have a rainy day with you. I said, but I want, I want to have this for myself. She said, oh, no need. I can take you to the, to the fifth heaven and you can start working on that level. I said, fifth heaven's not promised. Right here and right now is real. I said, so I want to I I work, work on me. I want to do this. Now, I tell you, I regretted it for a long time because working on yourself is hard work. It's hard work. But I tell you, there is no greater reward than when you know for oneself that you're liberated from this. And when you know for yourself, you still have work to do over there. Even if everybody else is saying, you know, like you don't, one can know for oneself. And that's what's uh, so important. You know, so he said that if you uh, embark on this devotional path, he said it's going to take you far, but it won't take you across the finish line. Somewhere down the road, you'll still have to do your own work. And he spoke of many beings being uh, near and supportive, although not of this world. He, he spoke of devas, and he spoke of brahmas, and he spoke of dakinis, and spoke of gandabas, and others that they call shining ones. And I know you don't hear too much about that, you know, um, but he did. And the third pattern that I want to talk about is the transformational pattern, the growth pattern, conforming, conforming to what we say we believe and holding as precious demonstrating how we admit that we ought to be in relation to each other because we get it not up here intellectually, but as a truly felt response of the heart. Now that the Buddha called practice. He said sitting in meditation doesn't involve anybody else. So I don't call that practice. He said, I call that in a pleasant, a pleasant abiding here and now. Nibbana here and now. But what I call practice is how we function in relationship to others when things are not going their best for us. And when you look at when they're mining for gold, I mean, we probably ourselves, if we've been in a cave, have uh, run across some gold, but we couldn't even recognize it. Because they have these little veins all in the, the rock and in the dirt. And it takes a lot of work to harvest that gold. It's heavy work. I mean, you're down in the cave and you're down there with the canary. When the canary start, stops tweeting, you're dead, you know. <laughs> I mean, and sometimes we feel like we're right there at the end. Can't go any further with it. I love it, but I can't go any further. I can't go any further. I mean, there have been times, you know, at my sangha. And some people like, just troublemakers. <laughs> you know what I mean? But my job is, is to love them anyway. You know? But I always say, I'm happy to see you come. And I'm happy to see you go. Like, if you don't want to be here, ditto. <laughs> you know? I'm not going to try to keep you here. Happy to see you come and happy to see you go. You know how hard it is to, to make a person comfortable who, who's in a place that they don't want to be? I'm not going to say, just keep sitting, just keep sitting, you're going to get... No. Life is short. And then we die. So, so you should go someplace. Look for, some, look, look for another. No, don't stand there like just raining on everybody else's parade. But if that one should choose not to leave, now we got a requirement. There's something that we have to do. 
And so this is how we evaluate, how we, how we work with people, how we will be in every uh, situation. There was a, uh, a sister, and she, uh, I thought she was my best friend. She was always encouraging me and always you know, teaching me things because she had been, um, she had, I think we ordained at the same time or maybe I was a, a month ahead of her or something like that. But I had a lot of time as a solitary nun. You know, so like I'm, I'm not like real polished with all of, all of the, you know, the, the rituals and the requirements and, and how, how uh, straight I keep my robe and, and, I, and how short I keep my hair cut and, and all these kinds of things, you know. But she was like spot on with all of it. And then when she would go to... Uh, prostrated at the altar. She just looked like an angel. She folded down and touched the floor and did the whole full prostration and she'd come up and it was like glorious. So I just wanted to, I'm with her, you know. And, <laughs> and she was so helpful to me, you know. But then I asked our master for her. Later on we, we, we had the same teacher at one time uh, we, but we never met each other. We were in different temples. And then later on, we had the same teacher, and we were closer together. And I asked uh, Master for permission. I said, you know, Master, the women in Thailand, uh, they need more than an advocate. They need a preceptor. And I asked her if I could go over and ordain. And when I first started going, I didn't have the years because you have to have, you know, 10 years and I didn't have the years. And I said, um, but if you will agree to ordain them, then send me in your place, you know, then I will go because she was up in years and she wasn't able to travel herself. And that's what she did. And what I didn't know was that this sister got upset because Master allowed that. She said, well, oh, then she must have been one month ahead of me. And we, we're strict on the timetables, you know, like for lining up. And, and, um, and so she was upset because she was a month, uh, had a month more seniority than me. But I didn't know she was upset. She never told me she was upset. I mean, she, she could have done it. I mean, like, it was no glory in it. I mean, it was arduous journey and people hating on you. And, you know, I mean, you know, she could have done it. And she harbored that thing year after year after year. And the next thing I knew, there were these little whispers, these little whispers. And I didn't know where it was coming from. And then people started pulling away, nuns. Six years later, I get a letter from the group of nuns. And they say, dear sister, we wanted to apologize for our behavior. See, when you don't do right in the, in the monk community, you get shunned. Say, they just don't talk to you. That, that's all. They just don't talk to you. She said, uh, we wanted to apologize for our behavior. We have watched your works over the years, and we've come to recognize that what we were told is not true about you. That is not your nature. So when I got the letter, I thanked them for their letter. They invited me to come and be a part of their community. I'm like, that's okay. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I, 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 I appreciated the letter. And it put me back in harmony and fellowship. Well, this is why I didn't want to go live with them. I was like, that's okay. You know, I'm, I'm good. I'm good right where I am. But over those six years, I had to learn how not to be angry and hateful towards people who falsely accused me. I would talk to the monks. The monks were my friends because the nuns weren't. And they'd say, don't, don't mess with that, Panwadi. I said, but I need to defend myself. He said, they say, that's not our way. They say, just leave it alone. Time will tell the story. And so time did. You know, by the time they came back for me, like, I'm good, a sister is good. 
you know. And I help them now because most of them are, 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 are cloistered and they need and they need support. And it's my my pleasure to support them. And when they have the confession day and when they have all of that, I'm just not calling in for it. And so. Um, so I didn't know, but this one who I thought was my best friend, I'm making a point with this story, the one who thought was my best friend was the one who started the rumor because she was jealous because Master had given me what she saw as an honor and what I saw as work. You know. So now I have Hartwood. And she calls because she's now being asked to leave the fifth place that she's li lived since we parted. I said, nobody can get along with her. You know. So when I see her show up on my call ID, I didn't answer. I, th I thought not answering was better than like telling a little white lie, so I just didn't answer. Um, not answering, that sort of means no. You know, I didn't answer. And she called again and again and again. She called for six months. She sent in uh, uh, an application. I just said, just leave it. Just leave it. But one day she called me like eight times in a day. And I knew when she called me that this was urgent. And I answered the phone. And she said, I'm being put out of where I am this evening. Honey, and I have nowhere to go. Can I come to you? I said, okay, I'm going to tell you the truth. She said, what happened? They're not giving you my messages. I said, they gave me every one of them. And I said, I didn't want to have to have this conversation with you. I said, but now we have to have it, you know. And I told her what I had found out because they told me who told them. They said, we don't even know you. She's the only one who knew you. And so, uh, and, and she told me, she said, I said, why did you do that? She said, because I was jealous because Master gave you that, uh, approved that. And I said, why didn't you just tell me? You could have gone with me. You could have done it in my stead. This didn't have to be something that we, you know, had a breach over. She said, I'm sorry, Pondwadi. It'll never happen again, you know. And so uh, I said, well, uh, I think it's going to be all right. I mean, you know, you, your bags are outside the door now, and, uh, you know, and I, and, you know, if you need a ticket, let me know, and we'll figure it out, you know. So I said yes. And then I went and talked to the monk that's there, too. He said, no. And I said, well, too late because I already told her yes. He said, okay, well, then that's your puppy. <laughs> you know? And he said, now, when, if something comes up, don't bring it back to me. You know? And I said, okay, I can handle this. You know, because like, you know, I'm, I'm strong in my, in my dharma, in my discipline. <laughs> and so she came. And it was a, a wonderful time. It was like, you know, we were on this honeymoon period, and everything was good. And then all of a sudden, you know, she was upset because they liked me at my own place. <laughs> she was upset because I was the Dharma teacher at my own place. <laughs> she was upset, you know, and, and she just got more and more. And I said, I said, sister, are we going to have this problem? Do we have to do this? I said, you can give classes. You can do what? No, I don't want to give them. So you don't want to give them, and you don't want me to give them. What are we doing here? <laughs> you know? And so it was just not rational, but just have, not working with you know, a ditty, not working with the jealousy and the envy. That's all. It's, it's, it can be a terrible thing. And the next thing I knew, she was gone. And she had taken the mailing list, and she had written everyone, and it said, don't trust her. And she did, and I'm starting a new sangha, which she did start, and I think it lasted three weeks before half of the people came back to our sangha, and the other half, I don't know where they were. So, so she caused a, 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 a split in the, in the sangha. 
And then six months later, they were telling me, uh, you know, she wants to come back. She needs to come back. Now, for me, I tell you the truth, for me, she could have come back. Because me, she can't hurt, you see. But she did hurt people in the song. And she uh, destroyed some people's uh, uh, happy mind with, you know, her own jealousy and envy. So for them, she couldn't come back. For me, she could come back. And then two months after that, she had disrobed. And so I say to us, we should count up the cost. There's a place that the Buddha is leading us. Her mind thought about what was needful for her. It thought about self-preservation. It thought about, you know, me, my, and mine. Not once did she take into account anyone else there. So he asks us to look and see what's going on in our lives. You know, if everybody's staying away from you, it might be for a reason. If, you know, we have to really, like, look at ourselves closely. Be willing to, don't be afraid to look. You know, you know what's the only thing better than looking and there's nothing there is looking and seeing there's something there. You know, and we can uproot it. But it's when we look into something there and we can't see it's there. Now we're in bad shape. No. And so he says, here's the $64,000 question. Situations may have taken us far from home. And home is where the heart is. So it may take practicing trust again. You know, we can practice trust. He said, we could also practice joy. You know, uh, the enlightenment factor of joy, when that is full, then we have equanimity. So if, you, if you're not full of joy, but you're thinking you're being, being equanimous, like you, it's, it's counterfeit, which is being detached. I mean, and, and there is uh, there's a difference, you know. But when one is equanimous, their heart is fully invested in the other, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's ugly. And they can hold that container. We may have to practice doing it, you know, like holding it and going home and crying at night, but you come back the next morning, never let them see you sweat. Just step right up again. You can take that two-minute break and go to the restroom, you know, doing whatever you have to do to just walk in, uh, in the uh, stature of the virtue that you believe is befitting of a Dharma practitioner. Practitioner. Not a yogi, not a meditator, a practitioner. And he said, we practice off the pillow in these unfortunate situations. That being a Dharma practitioner. And we can practice trusting. And that starts with one who may not be trustworthy. You know, but yet we can have some confidence in them. And our confidence, who knows? It may inspire them. It may become their confidence. How, how I wish I could take her back under my wing. For me, I would, and for her, I would. I actually had deep regret when I found out that she has had disrobed, because except for that thing, she was an excellent nun. But the energy of spiritual practice will take us where we want to go. It will take care of us. It will protect us. It will make us good for ourselves. It will make us good for others. No matter how much Dharma or how many scriptures we know, the practice is the most important thing. If you only know one line of Dharma, that would be good enough. There's a story uh, where the, uh, the, uh, there was a monk and he 
He just couldn't get things right. He couldn't get them straight. He couldn't memorize anything. And, and so, of course, they sent that monk over to, uh, to work with the nuns. And uh, the nun said, no, no, we don't, we, we don't, we don't want him. Uh, we, we, we need somebody else. And so they, the sto- way the story goes, the Buddha gave him uh, like one little line and sent him off to practice. And he would just recite that one line, that one line, that one line, that one line. And he awakened just from that one line. Um, And there were many times that he talked about waking up, you know, uh, just because one's heart was in the right place, it organized the mind, and immediately scales fell from their eyes. So we have the capacity to hold a moment by holding others in our own hearts. Are we willing to abdicate the throne of self to be there for others? That's the question. That means when we feel like it (laughs) and when we don't. He said, the sons and the daughters of the Buddha all practice this way. So as we move away from the flashiness and the things of ordinary life, we're moving towards something as well. And perhaps the most important pursuit is cherishing the person that's standing right in front of you, right now. The Buddha said, I remind you again, for what reason do we go from the ordinary life into the spiritual life? He said, to be a refuge for all beings. To be a refuge for all beings. Today, I'm asking us, to recommit, some of us to just commit to being there for the other. It's the first aspect of the opening so that we can come into union with each other. And then there is only one. He's not for uh, diversifying, he's for unifying. And we have to learn how to come together in that way. We have to learn how to be able to tolerate a slight and overlook a fault. Hmm. So today, I commit to that. Um, If in some way you feel that someone has abandoned you, I say to you, forgive, no matter what they do. He has given this charge to us. Forgive. This heart of gold, it's going to get battered and bruised. But you know when they start mining that gold, then they got to put it in the fire. I don't know, the temperature's a cabillion, cabillion thousand degrees. You know, so uh, to begin to melt it and allow the other uh, cheap metals to separate from it. And then uh, uh, the impurities rise to the top. So sometimes people get worse uh, before they get better. And so when I see people, you know, like acting out in the song or getting worse, I'm like, oh, they're getting better, they're getting better. Because something's coming to the surface. Heart's being pricked. You know, it's like, ouch. And it was, ouch. And it, ouch. And so we catch it, you know, but I always say, you know, that's one whose heart is being pricked. Can you hold them? Can we be the container for them? So you can't say, like, I don't know what's going wrong with me. It just seems like all of a sudden, you know, like I'm just getting, like, totally out of control. That's just the ouch factor, you know. Recognize something's pricking you and allow that to have its perfect work in you. 
So I'd like to end tonight. You know, I did something that I never, never do. I very, very, very rarely. And I uh, wrote out my Dhamma talk last night. Now, I didn't know that Norm was going to say what he said. You know, because most of the time I like to speak off the cuff. I like to kind of sense what's there, and I just dive deep because you can't hurt my feelings, and, and we can, like, really, like, help talk, you know. Um, but I wrote this out, and Norm said, well, I like it when people talk like it, but I like it when they stay on point, too. And I'm glad I wrote my Dhamma talk out because I can, I can float. I can go, I can go all over. Uh, all over the place. And then he came and sat right in front of me, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're going to close out with a song. Uh, some of you will probably remember this song. Um, the lyrics have been changed by Maureen uh, Hall, and, uh, and she's uh, singing it. But I just want to uh, uh, invite you to really uh, enter into the happiness of this song. And I, uh, when you start singing it, you're going to have to be trying to figure out how to sing it. So I, wanna, I, wanna, uh, I just want you to take a minute and look at the words. You know, and the, the words say, I want to live so I need to give so I won't stay stagnant in this heart so cold. A selfish rat race or open heart space. It's urgent now to choose a heart of gold. Yeah, I'm getting old. This keeps me searching for a heart of gold. Yeah, I'm getting old. And the, um, the song is upside down on the screen. I've been so self-absorbed that I have just ignored the eightfold pathway to a heart of gold. <laughs> And what I want to find, I won't find in my mind. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. And awakening unfolds. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. And awakening unfolds. So I can't just sit here in mindful bliss here and think that's all I need to take me home. That's only half the show. To grow, I really know, takes loving action and a kind outflow. The rest, just let it go. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Takes loving action and a kind outflow. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. And awakening unfolds. Hello, is there somebody who can turn the, oh, it's right? Oh, okay, we're ready then. Okay, now on, when you hear this song, I think you're going to hear some laughing in it, and I don't know what happened, but I think that's when the dog came in and started running around in circles, and so we were having a, having a, a, a good time, but let's, let's uh, sing out on this, okay? Now, how many know this song? Uh, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, I want to hear your voices. We're ready. If you don't mind, I'd like to come down and do this last song with you. I need new glasses. Still looks upside down.
to give so I won't stay stagnant in this heart so cold a selfish rat race or open heart space it's urgent now to choose a heart of gold yeah I'm getting old Keeps me searching for a heart of gold. Yeah, I'm getting old. so self-absorbed that I have just ignored the eightfold pathway to a heart of gold and what I want to find I won't find in my mind by serving you I earn a heart of gold awakening unfolds oh, by serving Iron a heart of gold, awakening unfolds. can't sit here in mindful bliss here and think that's all I need to take me home that's only half the show to grow I really know takes loving action and a kind outflow the rest just let it go yeah, need loving action and a kind outflow. The rest just let it go. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Takes loving action and a kind outflow. By serving you, I earn a heart of Unfolds. Oh, oh, by serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Takes loving action and a kind outflow. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Awakening unfolds. Oh, yeah, let's sing together. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Takes loving action and a kind outflow. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Awakening on bold. Oh, yeah. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Takes loving action and a kind outflow. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Awakening unfolds. Oh, oh, by serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Takes loving action and a kind outflow. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Awakening unfolds. <laughs> By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. 
takes loving action and a kind of gold. By serving you, I earn a heart of gold. Awakening unfolds. Oh, yeah. Awakening unfolds. Mm -hmm. Awakening unfolds.